I titled our message, What Would Jesus Do? What Would Jesus Do? You guys remember those bracelets back in the 1990s? I remember the NBA players wearing them, and then all of a sudden they get into a fight with those bracelets on. <laughs> it's, but it was pretty, pretty fancy. Um, it was, WWJD, those acronyms meant, What Would Jesus Do? The phrase was a reminder from, for them to attempt to act in a way that personifies Jesus, Jesus' teachings from the Gospels. While most, of, while most know the WWJD movement as a recent development back in the 90s, the wording has been around for more than 100 years. As Charles M. Sheldon, a Topeka minister and an evangelical Christian writer, used it in his 1897 novel titled, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? The idea of imitating Jesus and trying to be like Jesus is something that's been around forever, said Tim Miller, a University of Kansas professor of religious studies and an expert on Sheldon's life. So that's, I'm using that verse. And to sum it up, is it's basically what people, some people think that they need to do what Jesus did to be saved from the fires of hell. Some people want to do what Jesus did so they would glorify God. So both are, for the second is, is more correct. I would agree with the second one more. But then to the point of tonight, which is about grace versus grace and work still, um, we're going to narrow it down in an hour <laughs> or more. No, I'm kidding. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege to learn more about you, about your will for us, and how we should live and what we should know about, about your ways. Father, may, you, may the Holy Spirit in all of us, Lord God, give us a clarity of whatever it is that you are trying to teach us. Override my preparations, Lord God, and forgive us, Lord, for all of our sins and remove everything and anything that may distract us from hearing you and learning from you tonight. Father, don't let me say anything that's not true. Lord, just use me as your vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's start with this. So that's the backdraft of our tonight, okay? What would Jesus do? An action, an act, right? A, a, a proper Christian decision on a situation or a circumstance, right? But then, what did Jesus do? For you to say that I'm going to do what Jesus did, you have to know what Jesus did, right? There has to be some learning behind it. You have to know who Jesus is, right? You have to know what his wills and his ways are for a believer. But in regards to salvation, our salvation for us, because the bottom line of what would Jesus do for the, the first part, the other people that do it because they want to do good works and earn heaven, the sum, of, the sum of that is that they want to do enough good works so that maybe they can go to heaven. That's their sum of what would Jesus do. But if you see this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I, not, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law, the Ten Commandments. So what does that mean? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. That's it. That's all you need to know. So for the unbeliever, that's you're, if you're still trying, if you're sitting here right now, and you're fish, if you think you can still earn your salvation by your good works, and plus what Jesus did, there's an error. Same with the Galatian church. That is what Paul was struggling with. You, you will see it here. Galatians 2.21, Paul is still sharing to them his discussion with Peter. Okay, this is the last part of chapter 2. I do not set, uh, Paul speaking, aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So, whoever you are, if you're listening to this right now, hear or 
on Facebook two weeks from now, you're going to see this and you're going to, there's no adding to what Jesus has done. There's no more adding to it. Because if you can add, if you can add something to it, then he did what his work wasn't perfect. And, and we know that God is perfect. Amen? And everything he does is perfect and it's righteous. Correct? And everything that he did, we cannot overturn. So here, if it's so clear. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, speaking about the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that. And if you're going to be honest, the moment you walk out, just like me before, the moment I walk out of that confessional box, I'm already sinning. I'm already sinning. I'm already put, putting in my calendar, my mental calendar, that I'm going to be back Wednesday. Because I just stumbled five seconds after I prayed all those things and said all those things. Because there's no adding to it. But what we do, what we don't like as human beings is the feeling of we are not in control. Do you agree? We don't like the fact that we're just completely surrendered to something other than us or someone other than us. There was a time where Mikey and I uh, were riding in one car. I think this was after camping. And, you know, we still did a few more trips in California. And I was really exhausted. And he was talking to me, but my eyes were just, you know, he could see that I'm about to go to sleep, and I'm probably going to take him to heaven with me. So he said, uh, dude, do you want me to drive for you? I go, sure, man, I'm tired. He took, takes the wheel, I get in my seatbelt, he starts driving. Guess what happened to me? I was wide awake. I was wide awake because now I was, I was worried about Mikey's driving. <laughs> so he goes, dude, you can sleep, man. I got this. I go, yeah, I know you do. But I was wide awake for some reason because I wasn't in control. I wasn't in control. For many of us, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, accepting the work that was done on the cross, just accepting grace feels wrong because we have no part of it. And it hurts our pride because we feel like, number one, if you haven't accepted, if you don't think you need to accept Christ because you think what? You think you're good enough for heaven. That's your first fault because you're not. Second of all, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, but yet now you're adding just like the Galatian church, just like Peter, all of a sudden start following what was prescribed on the law for the, Jew, the Jewish people not to mingle with Gentiles. He starts withdrawing from them, right? He started following law versus what was truth, which was the grace. See, there, there's no confusion. There shouldn't be any confusion. What would Jesus do for a believer is not for you to earn salvation, if you're going to do what you think Jesus would do in a certain situation, make sure you're doing that, not for your salvation, but for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. And you know what? When we say that, amen, we know that there are times that we fail, right? There are times that we, just this, mor just this morning, I failed. I played basketball, and it was a championship game, game, and I failed. I failed. Certain words I wasn't supposed to say, and I'm like, man. What am, I do what am I thinking? You know, the stupid basketball game. I lost. I sinned against my Lord. You know, and we, have, we all have our bad days, correct? And doesn't that, doesn't that, isn't that soothing for you? That the grace of God has covered everything for you? Amen? Your sins today, your sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow, all covered. It has nothing to do with how good or how bad you are, how smart or how stupid you are, or stupider. No, I'm kidding. I know it's the wrong grammar. Next point. If it will move. Here. Oh, here, there. Galatians 3, 1 to 3. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, Paul addressing the Galatian church. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn, I would like to learn just one thing from you. 
Did you receive the Spirit? This is a by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? A rhetorical question, right? Well, how did you receive? If you've accepted Christ as your Lord, did you? What, did it happen because you followed the Ten Commandments? No, right? It didn't. It didn't happen because you followed the Ten Commandments. It happened because the Spirit revealed it to you. Are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Right? There's... Believer, if you think that you can, if you need to continue to earn heaven after accepting Christ, you're wrong. Okay? There is no adding to the salvation that we have received from Christ. I know this is a bit of a, a review for most of us because if you understand completely and thoroughly the grace of God, this is just a review. But at the same time, it's a very good reminder because. Who was he first referring to or speaking to earlier? The Apostle Peter. Right? We can easily forget because that's how we are. That's what humans are. That's human nature. That's the sinful nature because we get so many pat on the backs. We are all of a sudden, we think we've made it. Right? We think we're the big cheese already. We think we know it all. But it's a good reminder that it's not because of what we've done or continue to do for the Lord that keeps us saved or makes us saved. It's the grace of God and God alone. That's it. That's the grace and grace alone. Do you understand? Do, do we agree? Amen. Amen. Saved by works or by grace. It is saved by grace. And I love it. I love it. There's, there's no turning back from, from that truth. I hope... That if you have been attending this church, I, I hope that this is just like, oh man, he's back to this. And I praise God. If, if, if you've known this and this has been clear to you, praise God. But because for some believers, for some reason, they feel like they need to keep doing good works or else they will lose their salvation. Right? And that's wrong. Next point. Everybody should memorize this. Right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, that I underline these, this is not from yourselves. That's where the pride seeps in. Because once you start thinking that it's you and your good works, it's your, you helping your relatives in the Philippines, your niece and your nephews is how many how many Bible studies you're 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 leading, how many verses you've memorized. No, it's not that, right? It's not that. It's you. Know, you are saved because it, God gave you that gift, right? Now, I know parents. We make because we're human beings, right? We make gift as if they deserve it. I don't think you deserve this gift. At least me. <laughs> That's what I tell Alonzo and Gianna sometimes. I go, well, I don't know. I don't know if you guys deserve gifts on your birthday because you haven't been behaving. But gifts really is out of the goodness of the heart of the giver. Do we agree? Yes. It's when you guys give me something. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I know I don't deserve this. I'll probably talk to her once <laughs> this year. But yet she, she gave me a gift. That's, that's awesome. It's the goodness of the giver. That's what a gift truly is. It's not because the person receiving it deserves it. It's out of the goodness of the person giving the gift. And it is our grace is out of the goodness of the heart of our God. Amen? And if you look at yourself, if you're really going to be honest, you're going to say, man, I don't even deserve this. I don't even deserve this. But yet God Gave, us, gave it to us freely. Not by works so that no one can boast. Right there. Because we love to boast. Amen? Amen. We love to boast. Just look at your news feed. See how many of your friends are boasting about their good life. I don't, I don't even understand why there's sadness in the world. Because 
they're probably not my friends because all my friends are are partying, are happy, they're on trips, their children love them, their husbands love them, their wives love them. There's no problem. I don't know what where are you guys living in? Because my friends, they live in a world where it's all happy, it's all boasting, they got the promotion, they got the everything. Because that's human nature. And imagine if we can earn our salvation. Donated ten thousand dollars to the church today. God told me I deserve a man. I got, I got that mansion. Cha ching. That's your status. <laughs> imagine if he. Imagine if it's true. Imagine if you're gonna boast about it. Be careful. It's not by words that when you're. It's not just by words or by Facebook posts that you're boasting. It's sometimes by your action, by your demeanor. But all of a sudden, you're forgetting. All of a sudden, you become critical of the next believer. This is, this is a way of boasting. Because boasting has to do everything with pride, right? It has to do with pride. Now, you're walking the straight and narrow for many years, and you're seeing your brother or your sister that are not doing the same thing, and you become critical of them. You become critical of them. That's, in a way, you boasting. You know, if you can just say it, or maybe you've said it, how come you can't do it? I did it. Right? I mean, it's true. You did it. So, they, so can they, right? That's the truth. But if you say in a spirit where you're just judging them, that they are just so little, right? When we rebuke, we have to rebuke with love. Amen? Rebuke with love. Next point. In Galatians 3, 4 to 5, have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you've heard? Again, it's just rhetorical questions by Paul. You know, when you, when you give a rhetorical question, you're hoping that the person that you're asking this question to will start thinking, right? You're, they'll start thinking because your question is your statement, right? I do this, uh, I do a lot of this with my kids, you know? <laughs> Have you done your chores, right? It's really not a question. It's actually because I saw that they didn't do their chores, right? Do you understand me? It's really not a question at the same time. <laughs> I'm really wondering, too, if they did, did understand, but at the same time, it's rhetorical. We said, no, they didn't, because they haven't done it. You know, it's, it's, it's just like what Paul's doing here. Because everything is done by God's Spirit. If you have accepted Christ as your Lord, the Holy Spirit resides in you. This is our next point. Be believer, if you are a believer, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whether you like it or not. Whether you live like it or not. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are, right? If Again, I gave this example last week. There are nice houses, structurally sound. And there are not nice, so not, uh, not so nice houses. But the house has nothing to do with the person living in that. The person living in that house has all the control on what he could do with the house, whether it's a good house or it's a bad house. Correct? So the Holy Spirit resides in all of us. Now it's up to you if you want to be a structurally sound house of God or not. It's up to you. If you want to be walking around in this, while you still are here, on this earth with your strength. If you want to be walking around and living for your own selfish ways and reasons, then that's up to you. The day there, there's no point or hint of the Holy Spirit, of God working in your life, then that's really up to you. But a believer that makes a decision that I will live my life to glorify my Lord in everything that I do, wherever He places me, whether it's at work, at home, or at the grocery, or at the basketball court. <laughs> right? 
I'm so I'm making more than, than what I'm really. Wait, it, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? It's not because you've obeyed the Ten Commandments and then you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's when you accepted Christ as your Lord and you automatically become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Still in that point, in Romans 8, 9, have you guys seen the pattern, right? Whether it's Rich or, or, or myself or Pastor Charles or Pastor Julius, remember? When we preach, when we give a message, we use the Bible to confirm the Bible. Correct? Because the Bible is the ultimate truth. Sometimes we use life examples, but at the same time, there is more power if you see the same message in, di in a different book of the Bible. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Read, see? <laughs> and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Oh my goodness. Okay, so now who here has the Holy Spirit? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Who here does not have the Holy Spirit? No. It's, it's, this is the proof. We are all convicted by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that we can never argue with. We can run away from what the Holy Spirit is convicting us of when we fall and when we fail, when we sin. The Holy Spirit continues to bug us. Right? Have you felt that? He, he doesn't give you that peace. You're just, there's something wrong. You know, before, before I was a pastor, when I sin, and, and it's just a big sin, I, feel, I, I know it's a sin that, that, that I haven't given to him, and he keeps telling me to stop, and I would still commit that sin. I would feel like I have the flu. That would be my symptom. It's like a flu symptom type of feeling. And, you know, Pastor Jesus was good to remind me that's a good thing. At least you could feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit. You could still feel it. You're not numb. And I go, oh, man, that's right. Because the example of a dead person versus an alive person is the alive person is the only one that could feel something. Correct? Correct. Yeah. The dead person, no matter what you do with that dead person, you can beat it up, stab it. You're just wasting your time because they can't feel it. But an alive person can feel everything you do. You can, I, I, I know I've confessed to most of you guys how I was before, but yeah, I was a bit of a bully at school. And I like to hurt my friends at school, my classmates. What I like to do with those handkerchiefs, you guys do this? I just round it up. Waiting for the next victim that comes in. <laughs> yeah. And they feel it. And then I went from that to the needle. I'll wait for them to sit down. If you're my seatmate, I'll put it by your chair. Whoop. And I just took pleasure in these things. But they could feel everything. I'm surprised that they could feel even the smallest prick, you know, because they're alive, right? The point is they're alive. Okay, guys? <laughs> The point is, is they're alive. Everything that you do to an alive person, they will feel it. They will feel it. So, believer, can you feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit? Can you feel it when you're falling? Can you feel it when you're sinning? Can you feel him telling you, you should have not said that? Can you? And I hope you do because... You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully, as you feel that, you would yield to his leading. Amen? Amen. There are some people that are like, of course, you're a pastor. You're going to be saying that. <laughs> now, we're going to see this example through Abraham. Example of just be believing in God made him righteous, made him right with God. It had nothing to do with him following the Ten Commandments. Because in Abraham's time, the Ten Commandments didn't exist, correct? Yes, correct. In Galatians 3, 6, in Genesis 15, 6, and in James 2, 23, and also in Romans 4, 3. And he, speaking of Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. You see, church, 
It has nothing to do with whatever you think you are doing for God before you accepted Christ. And as after you accepted Christ, you doing good works is not to maintain your salvation. It's just a byproduct of the love that you have experienced with God. Amen? It's the experience of, it's the outflow. It's the result of that change that happens within. See, religion is by action, right? To show people and then hopefully they earn enough merits and then they go to heaven. Our faith is you believe first and you're right with the Lord. You gain heaven. And then if you're given the privilege to continue to live in this earth, then you will do the good works that he has planned for you from the very beginning. God for new. God's foreknowledge, church, we should never forget. God knows and knew everything from the very beginning. Nothing happened by accident. So the skeptic that's probably sitting here is saying, well, then if he knew, just like the experience that Rich, Rich and I had, the, the guy that we met last week, where he said, you know, I don't know. How can a good God let a 14-year-old suffer? You know, basically, his, his bad experience, and, and we told him that our heart breaks for, for what happened to him. And as much as our heart breaks for him, God's heart, heart breaks for him. All these things that are happening to our world, the, 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 the pain, the suffering, this is because of the sin. That, was, that entered into this perfect world that God initially designed it for. But despite that, God gave us an out from the consequences of our sin. Not we're, Believers are not exempted from getting sick. But the final consequence of sin, which is eternal death. Let's go here. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Abraham didn't do anything different than what we've done. If you accepted Christ, you accepted him as your Lord, it was, it was counted as your righteousness. Same thing with Abraham. It has nothing to do with whatever we think we did to earn our salvation. Second point. Reliance on the law, on the law means cursed by God. Still on Galatians. Reliance means if you're relying on the law, you're relying on following the Ten Commandments. You know, you're, you're, it's cursed. It's a, you're cursed, basically. But those who depend on the law to make them with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not. Who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. Let me get to my notes here. The law is like a chain of a ship that is tied on a dock. One broken link causes the entire chain to fail. So is one sin broken. And you have broken the entire law. That's what this thing is saying on verse 11. Since this is an all or nothing proposition, no amount of work can save anyone. Only God can declare us just. That's in James 2.10. Do you understand? If you want to follow the Ten Commandments and earn heaven, then you need to follow the Ten Commandments perfectly perfectly. And every single one of them. 
Because if you break one of them, you break all of them. Then you just lost your salvation. If you think you're going to get it through that. So anyone who wants to rely on the law, instead of relying on Jesus, you are cursed by the law. Oh, how does that happen, Pastor Joe? I don't even commit adultery. Okay, good. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. Well, in our culture now, my goodness, it's so hard to not even try to think about it. Because you're watching a basketball game and then a commercial comes in. All right? And then it just hits your senses. And now you're, and then all of a sudden you see it's a commercial for Lexus. You're like, what did that have to do with the car? <laughs> had nothing to do with the car. Right? But then he's just sinned. Well, I don't steal. Good. Do you lie? Well, no. He's dead, right? <laughs> and then the book says, all liars go to hell. So what are we going to do? If you want to follow one, you have to follow, if you want to follow the law, you have to follow one and everything perfectly. All of it perfectly. In order to be considered a law keeper, one must obey the law perfectly and completely. Only Jesus Christ has ever accomplished such a perfect obedience. That's in Romans 4 and 4 and uh, 10 and 5. So instead of saying, we're going to go back to our title. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. That's what Christ has done. That's the perfect thing that we need to remind ourselves. That what Jesus has done is that he died on the cross for our sins. To, rest, to release us from the consequences of the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, which is us, the Gentiles, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Again, I understand. I'm looking around the room, and there's just a few people that are, haven't, don't belong to our church, right? Because we repeat this. Constantly. This is a constant reminder for us. But at the same time, I want the members of this church, I hope that we're solidifying your stand on this doctrine. That when you share the gospel, or when you meet somebody at your work or your family member that you know is a good person, but has not professed Jesus as his Lord or her Lord, you need to share the truth to them. Are we clear? I hope so. I hope we're clear. Because we're saying amen to this. We're studying it day, every Sunday, every sun, Sunday after Sunday. But then we forget sometimes. When we meet a morally right person, morally better than us for most of the time. Right? And when we say, man, those people, they're so much better than some of the people at church. That I know. There's no way they could go to hell. Maybe, maybe Joe's wrong on that point. And you know I'm wrong on a lot of points. But on this one, I'm not. Because this is what Paul, Peter, you know, everybody. You read your Bible, not because they're good. But it's because of Jesus. Amen? So we need what does that remind us to? We need to be proactive in sharing the gospel. I can see a lot of people going like this, cringing, right? There's no other way. Somebody, they, somebody needs to tell them, correct? Somebody needs to tell them. And hopefully they can see it with your lives. Third point. 
Now there's a question on the third point. The third point is saved by grace, not by works. We are saved by grace, not by works. So what are we to do? Right? We have the question, what would Jesus do? But now what is a believer to do? What is Jeff to do? What is Noemel to do? Right? What is Rene to do? What are we to do if we are saved by grace and not by works? So now what? Can I continue to live my life the way I want to? Yeah, you can. <laughs> That's the hard thing. That's the hard answer for me to say. <laughs> you can live your life the way you want to. But you just... But that's not what God has designed for you. Because for you to continue to live, let's say you're living a sinful life, and you're a believer and you continue to live a sinful life, you just made Christ a somebody who condoned your sinful life. And that's not it. Christ said, be holy as I am holy. Right? We say, to know Christ to become like Him, to make Him known. There has to be that conviction. There has to be that deep conviction to all of us. Now normally, my answer would be Ephesians 2.10. But praise God, God gave me, revealed to me this next, the next book. Titus 3.1-3. Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. Wow, wait. What are we to do? Yeah, what are we to do? What are we to do? It's right here. If you're looking for like a list, right here, I'll give you a list. Submit to the government and its officers, whether you like it or not, whether you like them or not. So I'm going to be monitoring all your Facebook posts during these elections. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're on your own. <laughs> they should be obedient. Always ready to do what is good. Oh, that's so hard. Especially when you think you're right. Although, although you're right, but then you want to do something wrong. Because you're right. You feel right. It feels right. But then we have to be ready. Always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone. Oh man, I know I hammered this last week, right? Slander anyone must avoid quarreling. All right. Right there. So clear. See, quarreling happens when we feel like our right has been disrespected or uh, ignored. All right? I know for Filipinos, we don't, like, we don't like to be disrespected. I'm pretty sure same with Americans. <laughs> what am I saying here? No, but... From my experience, we can't even stare at anybody or else we get into a fight. Just the staring is disrespectful. What the heck? Right? No wonder the country's a mess. <laughs> no, but we're supposed to avoid quarreling. As believers, as the church family, we need to be what? The first and second commandment. Wait, wait Pastor, you said, you said no commandments. <laughs> no commandments, Pastor. No, but when we're following the first two commandments, we're doing it because of our love for the Lord. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And at the same time, Paul said, uh, the Hebrew writer the, in Hebrews, he said, be careful for we are being watched by a cloud of witnesses. We are being monitored by the world. They are watching and waiting for us to fail. Right? And sadly, we will fail from time to time. But here's a very good reminder. If you are asking, then what am I to do? If I'm saved by grace and not by works, and what am I to do? It's right here. We should be ready. We'll start again. Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. You're not to be an activist. You're supposed to respect the government. They should be obedient, not disobedient. Always ready to do what is good. Always ready to do what is good. Not when you feel like it. Not when you have time for it. I don't have time for this. 
That's a lot of Christian, American Christians. American Christians are always busy. Amen? Amen. I was very busy this week. I was very busy this week. But it doesn't mean that I can't be ready to do what is good. I was with my fellow believers as I was moving stuff. Did I fail? Yeah. You know, because sometimes when your muscles aching and, and you're hungry and dust is all over, you can't be nice, right? It's hard. But we have to always be ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to some people. To the people they like. To the people that give them gifts on their birthdays. To the people that greet them on their birthdays. No, it's to everyone. Correct? Yes, correct. <laughs> it has to be to everyone, whether we like them or not. We, instead, they should be gentle and show true humility. True humility, not false humility. An example of false humility is to say, you know, oh, hey... Brother, I heard you singing. Can you uh, help us uh, with the music ministry? Oh, no, no. I I'm not a good singer. That's false humility. Because you know you have the talent. Sorry? So what you can say is, if you want to turn it down, like, oh, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> right? So, but that's false humility. When people are complimenting you of something that's true, and you say, oh, no, 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 no. No, it's true. You say thank you. You say thank you. With a humble heart, thank you, and then praise God, right? So, true humility to everyone, to everyone, not just the people you like, but the people that do the right thing to you. When people do the wrong thing to us, what are we supposed to do? Retaliate? <laughs> when they say the wrong thing to us, are we supposed to say, oh, oh, oh. now you ask for it. Oh, you do the Bruce Lee scratch, you're like, oh. You killed my master. <laughs> now I'm going to kill you. All right? We do, we do our shuffle because, no, man, it's on now. No, it's, we have to be gentle and show true humility. Once we, once we, too, again, now Paul speaks about our old life. We're foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts. I like how he said slaves. Because all of those things before Christ, we were enslaved to it. Right? We were enslaved to it. You're like, man, I, I don't even know why I keep doing it. Joe, like, I don't want to do it anymore. But man, I, I keep going back to it. Because you're enslaved to those many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy. And we hated each other. That's the world. Now, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you're going to have to be above that, correct? You have to be in the first two verses. If you're asking, what are we to do now? Because Jesus did it all. What are we to do right here? But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Amen? He saved us from that slavery to those sins that we want to be done and over with. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Apart from Him, you can do nothing, church. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. When people irritate us, apart from Christ, we want to... Right? Strike. But with Christ and Him and the Holy Spirit empowering us, we can, and if you're really sincerely asking, Lord, hold me back. Don't let me retaliate. You know what? He will do it. I still have a big knot here. If somebody dropped a very big elbow from a rebound on my head last Saturday. And I already told you, I've been moving, so I'm irritated already. But my friend said, hey, man, we need you. Jeff got hurt, so we need some, we need some bodies here. So, okay. 
I really wanted to go back to my old ways. Because I knew who he was. I really just want to get back to the next play and just give him a taste of his own medicine. But as I was rubbing my head and like still trying to get my, my conscious, because <laughs> it felt like I had a concussion for a, mean, a meanwhile, but I said, Lord, help me not do what I want to do to this guy. And you know, he did. Praise God. But that's just a small, petty thing, right? But how about the other big things? How about the other big things when, when, when our family gets insulted? When someone insults our family, right? That's the cross that they weren't supposed to, right? That's the cross you drew in the sand. We're okay. Oh, you crossed the line. Now you're going to get it. All right, what if it's those things that we, we, we said for our, it's our life mantra. I'm a good friend. But um, uh, I forgot, in Tagalog, I know how to say it. <laughs> I'm your worst nightmare if you become enemies. Right? But he said, <laughs> I know, it's better in Tagalog, I think. <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, but when God, our Savior, revealed His kindness and love, He saved us. But not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He, God, generously poured out the Spirit upon us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Again, you accept Jesus as your Lord, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God generously gives you whatever you need to live the life that He intends you to live. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Amen? That's why there's a big difference of um, uh, when a Christian, when a believer dies, there's a great confidence that we're going to see them again, right? There's a great, it's, that's why we call it celebration of life. Because we know that there's a guarantee that we're going to see them again, especially if we to our believers. It's not a loss. It's just, you know, I'll see you later. It's not a goodbye. There's a guarantee because Christ said so. Amen. He paid for it all. When he said in the cross, it is finished, he meant it. It is finished. But then the question, if he has done everything for us and he gives it to us generously, why are we so anemic? Like lack of blood, right? That's what an anemic person is, right? There's... Their blood supply is not enough for their body. But there's a lot of Christians that are anemics with the Holy Spirit. Our life is not full of life. We're so much more of the world than we are so much of the Lord. To the question, what are we to do? Our, we're to do what God wants us to do from the very beginning. He saved us to do good works. I know, church, we always keep talking about this. I keep rounding you guys back to holy living for some reason. After we speak about grace and what Christ has done, then we round it up and, and, and wrap it up with holy living. Why? Because Paul said so. He said, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. To doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. <sighs> I don't know, it's, it's, it's spelled out right. It's put together properly. But for some odd reason, it's so hard to do, isn't it? It's so hard to do. That's why we keep going back to it. We are, we are talking about grace. But can you appreciate grace if you, can't, if you don't know of God's judgment? You can't. If you don't know where you are going to end up in without God's grace, you can't appreciate grace so much, correct? Correct. 
But then after that, what do you do? This is what you to do. This is what you are to do. We are to do good works because that is what God has planned for us to do from the very beginning. Why? Because we are to be a blessing. He blesses us so we can bless others. He blesses us so we can bless others. We're not to hoard our blessings. Whatever it may be. It could be your strength. It could be your time. Right? It could be your money. It could be everything about you. And we are supposed to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Right? That's a song. I'm going to break into a song. <laughs> no, but isn't that the truth? That should be our response. When God tells us to do something, our answer should be, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I wanted to take a break this Sunday. Because, I, like I said, I was really busy. But then, God wasn't letting me have that feeling when it's okay. I, it's weird. Because I know when it's okay for me to take a break. He makes me feel that, that it's good feeling. But this past two weeks, and I've been, I've been wanting to take a break. I called Richard one time, and he's like, oh, what do you want me to preach? <laughs> I go, I start talking, and I go, wait a minute, it's not feeling right. Let me call you back. You know, it's, so I know he wants me to preach. So my answer should be, yes, Lord. I'll do it. Because who's going to speak here? Me, but him through me. I just need to be available. So it's the same with you. We're not all called to be pastors. We're not going to be all Bible teachers or, you know, music or whatever. We're not all told to do that, but we're all told to do good works. We have to be ready to do it, to be gentle, to be loving, to be humble. We're all told that, right? Oh. Here we go. <laughs> so what would Jesus do? Jesus has done it all for us. Amen? He has done it all for us. The question should not be, what would Jesus do? Is what would Joe do? What would you do? And then after listening to the message tonight, the next question should be, are you going to do what he has told you to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your message this evening. We thank you for your truth, Lord God, and your grace, Father, that we don't deserve, Lord. Father, we, we thank you for the reminder that we are to do good works. And we thank you for the reminder that we are your temples. And Lord, that in your word you said that through him we could do all things. Teach us, Father, to continue to rely on you. To obey you. To do the things that you have moved us to do. Impressed on us to do. Forgive us, Lord, for the many times that we've failed you. But again, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that is new every morning. Father, we want to glorify you with our lives, Lord. Help us, Father God, to just be obedient to everything that you give us and tell us. Help us, Father, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives. Father, I pray for blessings for everyone that's here tonight. And I pray, Lord God, for that soul that still has to surrender their lives to you. I pray that this will be the evening that they will do so. I pray for that believer, Lord God, that has lost his way or her way, I pray, Father, that they will appreciate your grace all the more right now. And that they will live their life tomorrow or later outside this building, glorifying you, obeying you every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.